Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for our webinar on gardening for biodiversity. My name is Anne Goggin and I work in the environment section of Limerick City and County Council. I'm joined tonight by my colleague Sinead MacDonald um, and Sinead is the Environmental Awareness Officer with Limerick City and County Council. Uh, as you may know, Limerick was named a European Green Leaf City, City 2020 for its commitment to creating a more sustainable future. And we planned a wide programme of events to celebrate the year. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we had to postpone most of those events. So as an alternative, we're planning to host a series of webinars in the coming months on a range of environmental themes from biodiversity, climate change, rivers and sustainable lifestyles. Tonight's the first webinar in our series and we're delighted to have as our presenter Juanita Brown, who's the project officer on the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan with the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Uh, Juanita is a zoologist by background, which is very appropriate because tonight's talk aims to highlight that gardens can be as important for the creatures that they shelter as for the plants that they grow. Um, Juanita will be basing part of her talk on this beautiful booklet called Gardening for Biodiversity, which she produced in association with Catherine Casey. Catherine is the Heritage Officer in Leash County Council and funding for the project was provided by the Heritage Council and the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Braille Clubs. Um, if you'd like a hard copy of the booklet, you can send your name and address to the email address shown on the screen, or alternatively, you can download a soft copy from Limerick.ie website. Um, Juanita will also be talking a little bit about the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. If you have any questions for Juanita or Sinead, please send them in through the Q&A chat function and we'll answer as many as we can. We'll also answer some of the questions that came in by email over the past few days. And finally, before I hand you over to Juanita, can I just point out that while we've done the tutorials and the practice runs, this is our first live webinar, so please bear with us if there's any technical glitches. So with that, I'll hand over to you, Juanita, and let you share your screen. Thanks, Anne. Um, hopefully everything will go to plan, and I won't bore everyone. Um, now I am getting a host disabled share screen. Can you? Ah, see, <laughs> issue. <laughs> right. Okay. I think that's dealt with. <laughs> right. Is that okay? Yeah, great. That's it. Brilliant. So hopefully you can see that. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. working. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. So th thanks a million for the invitation. I was happy to talk about biodiversity. Um, so I, yeah, I'm going to talk about the booklet and then I will mention some of the work by the National Biodiversity Data Centre where I have my day job and I work specifically on the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. So um, you're very good to join on an evening like this if, if, you, if you're tuning in when it's so nice outside and in the middle of a public health crisis. I know there's, there's more worrying things at the moment, but I do think people are finding a great connection with nature at the moment and biodiversity has become you know, sort of in the spotlight, which is great, and I hope it stays that way. Um, so the booklet, I suppose, starts out explaining what biodiversity means. It's just another word to cover wildlife, but it's it's a better word because it means everything. It's genetic diversity, it's the diversity of ecosystems, of habitats, um, and it includes humans in that, When rather than wildlife doesn't tend to make you think of humans. So biodiversity is all the diversity of life on Earth, basically. And I suppose I wanted to kind of underline the importance of the smaller things, like the small plants, wildflowers and insects that we have in Ireland, and that we can help them in our gardens. Um, it's pretty basic, really. It's about providing food, shelter and water, generally, in your garden for wildlife. And then your biodiversity-friendly management. So making sure that you're not doing something in your garden that is actually going to damage or, or uh, endanger wildlife, for instance, using a lot of pesticides. Um, we have a, you know, a huge insect diversity in Ireland, over 11,000 species, uh, made of butterflies, moths, you know, we 1,200 different types of moths in Ireland, and lots of beetles, wasps and bees I'll be talking about specifically later. We've all these, you know, 35 beautiful butterflies that are found in Ireland. Um, 
lots of different types of ladybirds. A lot of people aren't familiar with them. You know, they tend to think of the, the seven spot ladybird. This is probably one of our most common ones. But we have yellow ones, um, you know, black ones, great variety. And the larvae, a lot of people aren't familiar with, actually. And they're also great predators of aphids. So they're to be welcomed in your garden. So if you find one, you don't have to think, oh, what is this? It looks kind of uh, scary. We also have shield bugs. A lot of people aren't familiar with these. So it's, that's just to give you a taste of the sort of biodiversity that we have here that we, you know, probably aren't used to looking for, but great uh, variation in, in form and size and colours. We also have different types of grasses, for instance. Um, so once you get your eye into these things, you start to see more and more. I just, I like this photograph because this sort of brings me into why we need to talk about biodiversity. Um, this is a windscreen, obviously, and it's been splattered by uh, bugs, uh, flies and, and uh, midges and so on. And this was really common, you know, at, at a certain age, we remember that this was a very common sight on long trips in Ireland, or even shorter trips. Uh, but you will notice, you may have noticed already that, you know, you don't have to stop and clean your car windscreen as often as you might have had to do in the 80s, for instance. Um, and that is actually recognised, it's anecdotal, but it's recognised by entomologists and ecologists as a windscreen phenomenon, that we are actually seeing an awful lot less insects than we used to. And it's, you know, it's a good indicator of what might be going on in the environment to make that huge change. I also think it's worth, I don't want to get too uh, scientific, but it's also worth uh, understanding this, this phrase, shifting baseline syndrome. I think it's a really powerful one. You know, we might grow up and think, yeah, everything seems the same. You know, I don't notice huge changes. I still see the same types of birds. Um, you know, I still uh, get robins in my garden, for instance, or uh, magpies. There's loads of magpies. There's loads of crows. You know, everything's fine. But actually, this ecologist, Daniel Pauly, in 95, um, you know, termed this phrase shifting baseline syndrome and what it means is that you know we change our perception of what is in our environment and it's kind of a dangerous thing in, in terms of ecology because what's normal to us might not have been normal to our grandparents for instance so uh, older generation will will tell you about skylarks singing in the fields and corn creek behind their houses and that isn't the case anymore um, or curly nesting uh, just beside them you know in quite suburban areas. So it is important to keep that in mind that while everything can look good and you can kind of have this idea of Ireland or any country having a kind of a green image and a green reputation, it might not actually be the case. It might be that you're just not seeing things uh, decline or abundant, decline in abundance. They might still be, you know, in existence. They're not extinct, but they're declining in abundance. So this is a much easier way to understand it is that, you know, in the 1800s, like fishermen were, were seeing an awful lot of fish and uh, they're seeing mammals, they're seeing, you know, large squid. And as we've increased our fisheries, you know, those larger species become less and less, understandably. And then, you know, today there's a lot of news, you know, out there about plastic in our oceans and, and less species. So they can also call it generational amnesia. So that basically, if this is what you're used to when you're, um, you know, in the ocean, um, if you're doing surveys and so on, you don't think anything's wrong. But actually, if we have enough records, we see that there's huge changes. And fisheries is very interesting because they do have that sort of data that, like, you know, as um, short time ago as the 50s, you know, they were catching absolutely massive amounts of large, large fish bigger than humans. Then they were getting smaller, and then a lot of our, um, you know, fish stocks are, have been depleted. So it's that again, shifting baseline syndrome that, you know, we d we might not notice it in our day to day kind of interactions with nature, but we are losing a lot of species. And um, a report came out from the you know, IPBES report, and it got an awful lot of news coverage about declines in you know all types of species, and again, abundance declines, which is really important. Some wild mammals. You know, we've lost 83% of wild mammals, 80% of marine mammals, 50% of our plants, 15% of our fish. So huge losses. 
The uh, WWF did a, a Living Planet report in 2018 that showed a, a 60% decline in global biodiversity. So again, we think of big species, we think of attractive birds, mammals, um, turtles and so on. But it's not just a global problem. You know, in Ireland too, we're recognising extinction and loss in biodiversity. You know, one in five, between one in five and one in four of all our species in Ireland are threatened by extinction. So they're really, really serious losses. You know, we look at the friendly map from our geography primary school days uh, and you think it can't be that bad. You know, everything seems the same. But we really are seeing, you know, huge losses in common farmland birds uh, like yellowhammer, corncrake or curlew. But this was a really interesting study in Germany a couple of years ago. So the scientists, their entomologists, were studying um, biomass of flying insects. So the number of flying insects that they could track from 1985, 1989. So for 27 years, these citizen scientists and, and entomologists went out and surveyed nature reserves. So I suppose that's what's most disturbing. They were actually doing all the research in nature reserves um, and they saw a 75% decrease in flying insects, which is a huge change over 27 years. And the fact that they're in nature reserves, you know, we tend to think of uh, our national parks and nature reserves as a refuge and a safe place for species and that we'll always have them there and that's, that's great. But actually they're recording those losses within large nature reserves in Germany. You know, and, and in winter, the average fell by 76%, but in summer, the drop was 82%. So absolutely huge uh, declines in insects. I like this uh, graphic as well, because again, it gets you into thinking, it's not just about having certain species, or we still have certain species. This is from the Peak District in, in the UK, but it's to try and emphasize that the numbers get mixed up, that we don't have large, you know, that they don't have large birds of prey, for instance. Um, or they don't have enough abundance of what we consider common uh, birds. So, yeah, Catherine Casey is the Heritage Officer in Leash County Council, and uh, she's been absolutely amazing to work with. I approached her last year about doing something like this, this um, idea of bringing together lots of simple things people can do in their own garden to help our biodiversity. And she got behind it with the heritage officers around the country and we were delighted to produce it this year. Um, so this is a graphic from the book and I really like it because it's simple and it kind of shows exactly what I've been saying. Um, but when you lose habitats, you lose species. So, you know, Ireland used to have a lot of um, different types of habitat, wetlands, uh, you know, small streams, lots of trees, hedgerows, and as it becomes more intensively uh, farmed for agriculture, you lose a lot of those species, um, niches. So you get less and less abundance of common species. Um, and just to say that there's actually over 2 million gardens, according to the CSO, there's over 2 million gardens in Ireland. So you can just imagine if some of those were to become more biodiversity friendly, what a difference that would make. And a lot of them are very, very big gardens. It's worth saying as well, you know, Ireland has the biggest houses in Europe. So we also probably have the biggest gardens, a lot of rural gardens with native hedgerow. And, you know, it's, it's a, quite a large land area. And those gardens can become stepping stones for biodiversity. So we discuss birds, of course, because birds are, are so popular. Um, really easy to help garden birds, you know, you, you can go out and buy seed um, and, you know, uh, coconut and really nice, uh, offer them nice types of food. You can also plant food uh, for them, so much more sustainable, you have it there forever. If you plant, you know, naturally fruiting and, and uh, shrubs and trees, and also ones that produce seeds, you're actually going to feed the birds in a very sustainable way. So there's lots of, you know, appropriate species like rowan or, or mountain ash, really, really good for providing um, lots of food. Ivy is a really important species actually, just not, not just for birds, but also for bumblebees and other pollinators because it, you know, it flowers late in the year and then it has berries over winter for the birds. So the flowers, feed the pollinators when there's very little else in flower in autumn 
and then the uh, berries will feed the birds through winter. Then of course, shelter is another aspect of a way to help birds in your garden. Lots of different types of nest boxes. Um, you know, the, the familiar, most familiar one is the one of the little hole for blue tits. Um, and then robins and um, other birds can use these open fronted nest boxes. Birdwatch Ireland has lots of information on the, uh, different nest boxes and how to make your own. And there's also a site called irishgardenbirds.ie where you can both actually have shops where you can buy these sort of nest boxes. Um, I have a particular fondness for house martins. A lot of people call them swallows, but swallows actually only nest in barns, um, open barns. So it's actually house martins that tend to arrive and try and build a, a mud nest on your house. And a lot of people don't like it and they give out about it. But I think it's really important to remember they've you know, flown 10,000 kilometers to Ireland, across Africa, across deserts to get here. And if you can put up with you know, a little bit of droppings around your um, pathways around your house, it's actually an amazing thing. Every evening we watch them around, we've, you know, about, I don't know, 40 at the moment, flying around, uh, picking up insects in the evening. And it's really, really beautiful. So we actually look forward to them arriving. And what you can do is put up, a, for want of a better word, a poop catcher to catch droppings from the nests that they use. You can also buy these nests so that if you didn't want them on your house, maybe you're happy with them being on your garage or on a different uh, gable end of your house. So you could maybe place them there to actually attract birds in. You might also want to uh, make your house suitable for swifts, so you can make or buy these swift boxes. It's a bit more complicated, but again, Catherine Casey was involved in a lovely uh, publication with Bird Watch Ireland on swifts and how to protect them and encourage them. Then really simple, ways to help or to actually not be too tidy in your garden. So an area of nettles, for instance, in a corner um, that, you know, won't get in your way or if, you, you know, you don't have um, small children, you can have these sort of nettle patches. Nettles are actually the food plant for a lot of our butterflies. So common butterflies like the small tortoise shell or peacock or red admiral, they all actually lay their eggs on nettles because they want to have the food supply for their young. Uh, right there when they hatch out. So the caterpillars feed on the nettles and then become these beautiful butterflies. So it's important to, you know, think of the life cycle of the animal, not just the final stage. You know, you don't want to just feed butterflies by having pollen and nectar rich flowers. You actually, you know, have to provide uh, food for the caterpillar stage as well. Um, another nice thing to do, especially with kids, is to make a log pile. So this is a really important habitat. I suppose with all of these different actions, you're talking about creating a mini habitat. So you can never replicate what, what we have in the wild. You know, you can't replicate a, a woodland in your garden, but you can replicate a woodland edge, a small edge of, of uh, you know, native hedgerow, for instance, or um, a small wood pile, which would be a bit like the wood that falls naturally in a, in a forest and begins to rot. So you're actually appealing to a lot of decomposers, decomposing species. Um, and it's really good to, to have a habitat like that. And by doing that, you're also providing, um, you know, food for birds and mammals. Like you're, you're going to have more insects um, there, more fungi uh, and, and small insects for birds to live off. Um, and the obvious one is native trees. You know, it's a time of uh, climate anxiety. Um, it's a really good thing to do is to plant some trees. And I, I would say that there's, you know, a tree for every garden. You know, you might think I can't plant trees, I've only a very small garden, but actually we have some really nice small varieties of Irish uh, species, like the spindle or even a hawthorn tree. Absolutely beautiful and amazing for wildlife. Like they will support hundreds of Irish insect species. Then you've a, a baker garden, you might want to plant an oak tree or a few oak. You know, again, if you, a lot of people live on farms, maybe there's places around the farm that you could plant some Irish native species. And obviously it's a climate action um, and it's also going to help our biodiversity because our insects, you know, have evolved to live on native species. They're also going to do much better. So instead of planting an ornamental uh, variety that, you know, needs a specific type of soil or uh, fertilizing or, you know, um, doesn't respond well to our insects and so on. You know, 
Irish native species are really hardy, so they're easy to grow. Then bats, um, you know, we have bats living in our garage. They don't cause, you know, they're not dirty, they're not blind. They are really, really clean animals, actually. They only eat insects. We have nine different species in Ireland. They only eat insects, so their uh, droppings just powder up. You know, they're not, uh, there's no smell. So they just stay in the summer in the attic and uh, come out each evening to um, hunt. And again, you can see them uh, at dusk hunting for insects. They take, you know, a, a small pipistrelle can take 3,000 midges a night. So they're helping us with that, uh, with midges in the garden as well. And if you want to help bats, you know, you can put up these, sorry, these bat boxes on a tree or more importantly, you know, planting uh, lots of um, plants and flowers that will attract moths and night flying insects is a great way to help bats. So things with it that, you know, release their scent at night, like honeysuckle, are really, really good to attract moths. And some of our moths are absolutely beautiful. So it's, it's a nice thing to, to attract. Um, so just uh, ponds, obviously ponds is a bigger thing to do. You know, we, we talk, I'll talk later on uh, when I'm talking about pollinators about wildlife lawns and, and sort of simple things like reducing mowing. A pond is probably a step further, a big step further from that. A lot of people don't want to, the work of, of putting in a pond. But once you do, you know, your work is done. If you do it right, uh, we put in a pond a few years ago and it's absolutely amazing. You know, the frogs arrived uh, the following year. You don't know how they get there. Like all these water boatmen and pond skaters, all these insects arrived, dragonflies, damselflies, that if you build it, they will come. Um, and it's important to say that, you know, we've lost a lot of that habitat as well. You know, over a hundred years, um, the 1900s, we lost 50% of our ponds and, and wetland areas that were drained for, you know, production and up to 75% in places. So especially in the east of the country, we've lost an awful lot of those natural wetlands. And one good thing about frogs is, you know, they're a major predator of slugs. So if you don't like slugs in your garden, you, you should encourage having frogs. And of course they're amphibians, so they don't spend the, any time in the, the pond. They just go there to mate, to breed, they return to their traditional breeding uh, ponds every year. And then they'll spend all their time living in long grass and around your hedgerow and play, or your log pile, places like that, looking for insects and they hibernate over winter. So you might not see them, but they're there and they're helping you if you have uh, want to keep the slugs and snails off your plants. So yeah, to, to, if there is room for a pond, great. Um, also to say that, you know, frogs are a really important part of diet for more attractive maybe mammals like otters, you know, that by helping these smaller uh, species were actually helping lots of different types of, of wildlife because frogs will travel as well. They'll, you know, they could travel half a kilometer to reach the pond. So in that they're actually crossing the countryside as well. So there's just very simple instructions on how to, to put in a pond um, and the sort of species you can see. The Herpetological Society of Ireland has lots more information and are great if you have any specific questions. A bog garden is also a nice idea if you don't want to have open water um, in your uh, garden. So that's basically kind of the same thing, lining it with um, plastic and then using a, hole, a hose with holes in it to fill it. Or you might have a naturally wet part of your garden that you're happy to use as a bog garden. And then it's just about, you know, putting in native species or water loving species that will you know, provide um, homes for lots more insects and pollinators and food for pollinators. Hoverflies are our next uh, most important pollinators after bees. Um, and the hoverflies like these sort of damp areas and wetlands and, and breed there. Um, then just to mention recording your backyard biodiversity, you know, there's some lovely monitoring schemes uh, through the National Biodiversity Data Centre. You can get involved in any of the, the regular schemes like butterfly monitoring or there's a garden butterfly scheme this year, the butter, bumblebee monitoring scheme. And a really nice one to get started on is the flower insect time count. So you just go into your garden or local park and watch uh, a patch of flowers 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters for 10 minutes and record the insects you see. And you don't have to record a species level. It's uh, very straightforward. There's lots of help on the website and pointers to get you uh, going, but 
it's things like whether it's a fly or a bumblebee or um, a hoverfly. So it's quite straightforward and, and easy to get into and provides really, really good data. So it's really nice that you're out, you're experiencing nature, but you're also contributing. You know, if you make your notes or you use the app on, the, on your phone, the Biodiversity Data Capture app can be downloaded for free and you just put in your records straight away of any species you see when you're out and about. So yeah, just to mention these great NGOs that are working away in Ireland have huge amount of resources. Um, the Native Woodland Trust, the Irish Wild Trust, the Herpetological Society, um, and all the heritage officers working around the country uh, are doing a fantastic job. I just like this photograph because, you know, we tend to see maps, this is from Glasgow, but we tend to see maps all the time with streets and street names. But this was a, a wildlife garden festival that Glasgow held. And it was a really nice idea, I think, to actually show this is what wildlife see. You know, this is these are the patches of green in our towns and villages and cities that are actually home to, to different species. And I suppose that's the essence of wildlife gardening is to see your land as, you know, the privilege to actually manage and that you can manage it in a biodiversity friendly way. Now, just to talk about the pollinator plant, because um, it's a really good example of how you can take really small actions that won't cost money and it, yet it'll make uh, your garden much more um, biodiversity friendly. So bees have become very popular, you know, we see it all the time on social media, everyone's tweeting and um, talking about bees everywhere. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we take it for granted that people know why. Um, my son has just gone 11. And I, it was, I'm ashamed to say that we have an apple tree and it was in beautiful bloom uh, a few weeks ago. And he said, why? I thought this was an apple tree. Why does it have all these flowers on it? And I had to explain to him that, you know, yeah, pollination means flowers become apples. So, you know, maybe we take that for granted that why pollination is important. So without pollinators, we wouldn't have a lot of our uh, really nice fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, a lot of our crop pollinated plants rely on or benefit from insect pollination. And bees are our five star pollinators. So really, really good at pollinating because they are focused purely on collecting pollen. So they feed the pollen to the larvae in the nests. Um, whereas other insects might eat other things or bring back, uh, you know, insect remains to feed to the larvae. Bees are purely focused on pollen and drinking nectar. So why is it important? So pollination contributes 59 million annually to the Irish economy and that's growing all the time. And what is really important to say is it's irreplaceable. You can't just go in afterwards if we lose our, you know, wild pollinators and try and fix the problem or hand pollinate crops. So without our pollinators, you know, it would be really expensive to try and have the same variety of foods on offer. Um, and it can be itemized, obviously, on different crops. But that idea of it being irreplaceable is, is you know, important to note. So we have, you do see a lot of scaremongering on, on social media that we'd uh, die after the bees die. That's not strictly true. Obviously, we'd have a lot of crops that are wind pollinated still, with the cereals and, and things like that. But it is important to say that it would be a lot more difficult to have a balanced diet. We do rely a lot for our nutrients on these insect pollinated species. And wildlife and landscape. So this is often overlooked, but bees are integral to how the countryside looks. So they pollinate 78% of our wild flowering shrubs and, and flowers and trees. So Ireland would look like a very different place if we didn't have uh, bees in the environment. So they're doing, they're out, you know, feeding their young, but at the same time, they're providing this free pollination service that's really integral to selling our products abroad as well. You know, we, we want to sell our products. You know, Ireland has that green image. Um, and if we're selling meadow butter or, you know, something branded as, as pure and good and from a natural countryside, we want that to have substance, not just be spin. So that's, a bit, you know, important to protect our biodiversity. So more wild bees mean more wild plants, basically, because, you know, they're developing seeds. So you're, the, the bee is a catalyst for that. And it means more seeds and fruits because it's pollinating in a hedgerow, for instance. If it pollinates the white thorn, you get, you know, haws later on in the year. And it means more birds and mammals. So um, they're just a really 
integral part of, of ecosystems. Who are the pollinators in Ireland? So most is done by our wild bees or by our bees. And then the rest is done by other insects, including a little bit by wasps, hoverflies being the most important um, after the bees. We have 99 different bee species in Ireland, and that includes just one honeybee, uh, 21 bumblebees, and 77 solitary bees. So these are the wild pollinators. And a lot of people talk about honeybees an awful lot, but actually, you know, most pollination is actually carried out by our wild pollinators, by the bumblebees and solitary bees. So they've done research in the UK that showed if all their honeybee hives were used purely for crop pollination, they'd only be able to fulfill about one third of the service required by crops. So it's really important that we have healthy honeybees, obviously, but with a diversity and abundance of wild bees and other pollinators like hoverflies. So these are 21 different types of bumblebees, really beautiful, interesting animals. A um, lot of variety. They're not just the you know the yellow and black striped ones that we tend to think of straight away when we think of bumblebees. There's red-tailed bumblebees and a lot of variety. And just to explain why they're in trouble, is what I'm getting at. Um, the queen bumblebee hibernates over winter, and uh, she's after mating, and, and she goes into hibernation. Then when she emerges from hibernation, she has to feed and find a nest site and prepare a pollen loaf visit lots of flowers, prepare a pollen loaf and a nectar pot, and then she starts laying eggs, fertilized with sperm stored from the previous year. These will become female workers that will take over the nesting duties, and then the queen lay, remains in the nest laying eggs. And then later in the summer, she lays unfertilized eggs, which will become the new queens and the males. And they are the ones that will leave to find uh, mates. So it's those mated new queens that would then will go on to hibernate. So as you can see, the females do all the work. I always tell this joke, but it's true. The males uh, are only interested in chasing girls and drinking nectar. Um, luckily, there's no other parallel outside of bees for that. Um, so the females hibernate underground in north facing banks. And then in, in summertime, you know, they need safe nest sites, which are usually in long grass, often at the base of hedgerows. So they need that food source food sources and safe nesting sites right through the year. And it's important to think of, like say this is, uh, this is an apple farm in, in Tipperary, an orchard, and if that farmer wants lots of bumblebees around to pollinate his apple trees, he can't just rely on the apple blossom when it's in flower to feed the bumblebees. He also has to know that there's safe nesting sites and hibernation sites within about one to two kilometers of his trees when they're not in flower. And that there's plenty of wild species like willow and dandelion, really, really important uh, airy sources of nectar and pollen, and things like clover and knapweed and ivy later in the year. So that's where the hunger gaps are. You know, we tend to think of bees in the summer months and we want to go to a garden centre and buy bee friendly flowers, but it's actually early spring and autumn that there are these hunger gaps and, you know, it's affecting their ability to reproduce. This is Bombus terrestris, a very common buff-tailed bumblebee. And when she emerges, this queen emerges from hibernation in early spring, she has to visit 6,000 flowers a day just to get enough nectar to maintain the heat, to brood her eggs. A bit like birds, they, they brood their eggs. So things like willow and dandelion are hugely important. No matter what you think about dandelions in your garden, you know, you have to start seeing them differently when you know that. Um, and then in autumn, again, really, really important for them to have things like ivy that's in flower and bramble late in summer, you know, to recognise that they are the, their go-to um, food sources. So we have 77 different types of solitary bee, and a lot of people don't know these guys at all until you start to, to watch them and look for them. Lots of different varieties. Um, and, you know, they are different. They don't uh, have a nest with lots and lots of uh, larvae. So bumblebee nest might have 200, 250 um, bees in the nest at the height of summer. But these guys are solitary, so they don't have a colony. Um, so instead, the females and males, uh, they overwinter as larvae. They come together in spring and mate, and then the female prepares a nest and collects pollen, leaves a food supply of pollen. All the males and females die, and the larvae that overwinter. So again, they need safe nest sites and food sources right throughout the season. And they are really, really important pollinators. So 
you know, it's been estimated that one red mason bee does the same work as between 120 and 160 honeybees, which is amazing. And the reason they're so good at pollination is because they're really bad and inefficient at collecting pollen. So unlike bumblebees and honeybees who have evolved to moisten the pollen and store it in these specialized areas on their back legs as a moist pellet, um, solitary bees either carry it just under their abdomen or loose on um, as loose pollen on their back legs. So it means they have to make a lot more trips, so they do an awful lot more pollination. Where do they nest? So 62 species nest in uh, earth banks, like exposed earth, often on south or east facing banks. And then 15 are cavity nesting species. So you do hear more about these guys. Um, only about 10 of them will use garden nest boxes. So if you do want to encourage solitary bees in your garden to have a habitat in your garden, it's much better to go out with a spade and create this sort of uh, bare earth bank for them. Or if you have it naturally, not to plant it up, you know, just to leave it as is and not to spray it with pesticides, it's really important. So you're going to appeal to a lot more species that way. And it is also important to say that, you know, the small nest boxes like these ones, if you are putting up a nest box, we'd recommend small ones rather than the giant ones that are quite popular with schools and um, groups, unfortunately, because you're putting an awful lot of organisms into the one space, into a small space, and you're more likely to, you know, um, be at risk of predators and, and disease. Um, so solitary bees travel even less than honeybees. They'll only go, you know, about 100 to 200 meters from their nest. So again, with that apple farmer, if he wants solitary bees there pollinating his um, apple trees, he has to have lots of food sources within a really, really small area. Are they declining in Ireland? Yes, unfortunately. So we've 98 wild bee species and one third at risk of extinction. So over half have gone through huge declines since the 1980s. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, the National Biodiversity Data Centre is monitoring that all the time. And since 2012, we're seeing declines of 14% in, in common species. It's important to say that these aren't rare species. So the rare species are disappearing through loss of semi-natural habitats, but the common species are also declining in abundance, like we were talking about earlier. So that's a consequence more of how all of us are managing the landscape. So why are they declining? It's, it's really about food. Ultimately, the, the biggest problem is lack of food in the landscape. So we used to have a lot of natural, traditional hay meadows uh, with lots of flowers. We used to have a lot of wildflowers in our verges um, and on you know, uh, parts of land that hasn't been developed for uh, agriculture. But we don't have that anymore. You know, we've changed our land management. And we also tidy up an awful lot. So even in parks and in gardens, we're, you know, we're used to kind of tightly mown grass and we're not providing those wildflowers that are so important for food. So it's a general decline in wildflowers, lack of safe nesting sites, the use of pesticides, climate change is another issue, obviously. And we've also inadvertently, you know, introduced pests and disease. So the pollinator plan is a really ambitious plan. And um, it's the brainchild of um, Una Fitzpatrick in the data center and Jane Stout in Trinity. And they just were recording declines all the time and they wanted to do something about it. And instead of just saying, this is the way it is and nothing's going to change, it's, they embarked on this really ambitious plan and came up with uh, 81 actions to make Ireland more pollinator friendly. Um, and it's, it's a brilliant, approach that I haven't seen before. You know, they, they got loads of different organizations, there's over a hundred now governmental and non-governmental organizations who agreed to, to take part in this shared plan. It's run by a, there are some of the partners. It's run by a 16 member steering group um, from across the island. Um, obviously the data center, Trinity College, uh, the EPA, DIRA, in Northern Ireland, Cedar in Northern Ireland, Butterfly Conservation, Department of Agriculture, uh, Beekeepers Associations, Chagas. So a great cross-section of uh, all different sectors. You know, the local authorities are represented, Transport Infrastructure Ireland and the National Trust. Um, important to say that it's been done on a shoestring, like it is actually amazing what they have achieved um, since 2015. And um, we're going into the next phase now, 2021 to 2025, and we want to have an even more ambitious plan. But 
I think we need funding now. This, you know, it's been done with no project funding to date. So the steering group, you know, are working on a voluntary basis. And um, Una is the project manager, and she does it within her existing role in the data center. Um, I'm in the position as project officer at the moment, and that's been funded till the end of the year by Super Value, which we're very grateful for. And the Department of Agriculture have provided um, 15,000 year, uh, each year to produce all our publications and get them printed and distributed. So that's been absolutely brilliant. So to put it very simply, if you want to implement the pollinator plan in your garden or your school or business, it's all about that's those same three things, food, shelter and safety for pollinators. In terms of shelter, it's very straightforward. It's often long grass for bumblebees, the bare banks for solitary bees and cavities in existing cavities in you know, holes in wood or bee nest boxes. Then safety, it's about reducing or eliminating the possible bees of pesticides. And then food is providing areas that, you know, you're going to let those wildflowers come up. Um, there's lots of native plants, you know, we've lots of lists on our website about what is, usually our native ones are just naturally pollinator friendly. Um, and then there's also ones that you might want to plant. So you don't want, you might not want your garden to go wild. That's absolutely fine. There's heathers, there's herbs, there's so many different types. There's pollinator friendly tree varieties, fruit trees, lots and lots of things to choose from. And they're all, you can download them all from pollinators.ie. We produce um, sector, you know, focused guidelines on how each sector can help, whether it's a farm or a school, um, or a council, local communities and businesses. So there's over 240 businesses signed up as supporters of the pollinator plan. Um, and we also have a mapping system for gardens. So you can go in there and put your garden on the map. Over a thousand sites have registered on that. We also have guidelines for uh, transport corridors uh, and lots of really specific ones for faith communities, group water schemes, golf courses, and we're being asked for them all the time. It's almost like a publishing house now at this stage, but. Uh, we just want to provide free sharing of knowledge and it's amazing to see groups uh, share that knowledge and inform each other on what worked for them. So it's about everyone doing a small bit. It's not about, you know, um, it being the responsibility of one area. This is about local authorities coming together, businesses, schools, everyone doing a small bit to make their land a little bit more pollinator friendly. And you can see that you're creating, if you can do that, you're creating these natural stepping stones through the landscape for our pollinators. If we just think about making a town more pollinator friendly or a village, you know, this is Waterford, and um, this is the large Carderby, which is, um, you know, not doing so great in Europe. It's on the European red lists. It's not as bad in Ireland. We, we do still have good populations, but, they're often on really nice semi-natural habitats, but uh, Waterford County Council um, developed this nature uh, park, it's Kilbarry Nature Park it's called, and it was from an old landfill site right in the centre of the city and now um, having, you know, never been seen within the city limits, the large carter bees showing up there. So that's the great news about bees and other pollinators. They do bounce back. It's not, you don't have to wait very long once you put in the right sort of conditions and the right food. We also have a framework for councils to sign up. So over 23 or 23 councils have signed up as partners to the plan, which is uh, brilliant and are changing the way they manage uh, park grasses and public land to make it more pollinator friendly. The website has an awful lot on it. Like I know that uh, if you have questions, the answers are all here. So. Like I said earlier, if you are helping bees, if you're making your garden more pollinator friendly, you are also making it more friendly to birds and mammals and so on. So if you want to plant something good for wildlife or for biodiversity, plant something that's pollinator friendly. And all the lists are there free to download. And this is our mapping system. So as I said, if you're doing taking actions, uh, it's nice to be recognized and you can go in there as a business or a council or a gardener and put in the actions that you've taken. Then if you want to get involved in recording in your garden, there's the fit count, or if you want to go on a walk once a month um, from March until October and become part of the Bumblebee Monitoring Scheme, it's really, really nice. All training is given by the data center. There's swatches and identification guides and an interactive course on the website that you can take part in and you can see all the happy faces. People love getting involved and in learning the skills. 
Um, and then just simply the actions um, that can really help in your garden, the most important being identifying areas that are already good for pollinators. It doesn't cost you any money. You might have you know, a lavender or a cat mint or something in your garden and you know it attracts bees and you decide to keep it. That, that's really good. Or if you have bram an area of bramble or ivy or a native hedgerow, can you let it flower? Or areas like this that are providing, um, you know, uh, nesting sites for bees. Native hedgerows are really, really important. So we, we tend to see these sort of uh, hedgerows around the countryside more and more. And unfortunately, it's a tendency, not always for road safety. Road safety is completely understandable, you know, but off-road hedges are also clipped like this often. Um, they don't provide value for pollinators. They don't provide food. What you're looking for really is flowering hedgerows that are have flowers in March with blackthorn and then in May with whitethorn. So if we can manage our hedgerows differently, it would do a huge amount for all types of insects and birds and mammals. Um, so if you do have native hedgerow in your garden, you know, try and keep it. And if possible, let it flower by cutting every three years. Then mowing, this is a big one. So really simple, doesn't cost anything, it'll save you money. You know, if you can let the dandelions bloom, if you don't cut your grass until mid-April, um, and you can cut it before they set seed, if you don't like that stage. Um, you can mow it every six weeks, that's another option. You know, there's a great campaign at the moment called No Mow May, and that's to let the clover bloom, which is another important, really important food for bees. Uh, this is Una's garden, I think it's really nice, she created this wildflower strip. So you still have areas to play uh, for children, but you also have this strip for pollinators. And this photograph really shows how important dandelions are. You know, you see the, the pollen sacs there on the back legs where this, been collect, this uh, bumblebee has been collected pollen. And this is what the bee sees, you know, so they have different um, eyes than we do. So they're, dandelions are almost like a target for them. Um, a great uh, farmer who helps us a lot on the pollinator plan, um, John Fogarty, he, <laughs> said to me once, the most dangerous thing in Ireland is a middle-aged man who gets himself a ride on more. And we all know these people. I'm married to one of these. And uh, it is tempting to use it a lot. You know, we're seeing an awful lot of uh, golf course type lawns out there now, especially during the lockdown, actually, when people are at home more. And um, we're, we're cutting the grass, we're tidying up an awful lot. And we would just say, you know, maybe you can leave a little bit more. Maybe you can let grass grow up around trees um, or not mow your verge. So this is an example of a lawn where, you know, you have tightly cut grass. This is like a desert for insects and pollinators. There's no food there. This is an area that would be cut less frequently, maybe every six weeks or every three weeks. And it has lots of clover, some bird's foot trefoil really important to provide pollen and nectar. And then areas that are cut just once a year. So they will provide shelter as well, nesting sites. So there is a balance that's achievable, whether it's a tiny strip in your garden or a larger area that you can let grow. These are amazing pictures from a, a garden in Mayo from Donna Rainey. Um, there's a brilliant scheme in Northern Ireland called Don't Mow, Let It Grow, and they've been really successful at, about uh, road verges in particular. But she took this picture in a Mayo garden and again, you know, this was an area that was kept really tightly mown. And if you imagine, they if they never tried, if they never let this area grow wild, they wouldn't have known that these wildflowers would appear. And again, it can look really pretty. One great thing to do is to mow uh, paths through your wildflower area so that, you know, it's used more. You can get in with nature and be exposed to nature. And I should have mentioned that earlier, but it, how good it is for your mental health. So it's been proven that time in nature is good for your mental health. You know, in, in Japan, if you go to a doctor, he can give you a prescription for forest bathing, they call it. And um, it's been proven that spending time in nature is actually really, really good for you. And also that the more biodiverse an area is, the better it is for you. So if you compare going for a walk in a really tidy town park, that isn't as good for you as maybe in a very biodiverse grassland like this or through woodland. So why not bring that into your back garden or your front garden? It's actually really, really good to be able to hear the bees and hear the birds and see that sort of variety of life right outside your door. This is a really good story from Leash. Um, at Port Leash Housing Estate where this orchid, the green-winged orchid, showed up for the first time after 120 years. 
uh, it was identified by Robert Lloyd Prager, a famous ecologist, and it hadn't been seen in that area for 120 years. And because uh, the council weren't able to mow the, the housing estate, it's actually shown up in Port Leash. So it just shows, again, the seed bank is there. You know, a lot of people ask, I saw some questions before we started about where do I get wildflower seeds? The seed, but seeds survive in the ground in a long, long time. So we would always say, wait and see what comes up naturally first. Much better than bringing in seed from somewhere else. Uh, or if you're not sure if it's native seed, there are stockists of native seed in Ireland, but that's more expensive and complicated and much, much better to keep it local and see what you have naturally. So these are road verges around me um, in Kildare. Lesser Celandine, dandelions in Kilcullen, where the tidy towns groups have stopped mowing and it looks great. Cow parsley is in bloom at the moment, I think it's beautiful. Uh, bluebells, so again, important to say, you know, you can, mow, you can still mow a verge for walkers, but maybe you just mow one meter, the width of the, or the width of the lawnmower. It doesn't have to be the whole verge, like we're, we're seeing lawns now outside hedgerows, outside fences and, and outside houses. And refuge, like they were always a refuge for wildflowers and wildlife, our road verges. So it'd be nice to get back to that and it makes drive through the countryside a lot more interesting. So these are, are some from Don't Mow, Let It Grow in Northern Ireland. You can see orchids coming up um, within those verges. And it's about getting used to that look actually. So this is um, a very tightly mown bank, like kind of dangerous to be putting a lawnmower up there. Um, you know, this is the same bank when you let the dandelions bloom. You know, can you accept that? This is another uh, view of that road in Kilcullen where they've, you know, they had uh, daffodils all along here. And it's important to say that daffodils are no good for pollinators. So they don't provide pollen nectar. So if you want to plant something, you know, it's geraniums, begonias, busy lizzies, those sort of flowers are actually a bit like putting out plastic flowers. They offer nothing for biodiversity. They're bred to be showy to provide colour, but there are other options, you know, even, even by adding Biden's or Bacopa, um, Peter Cuthbert has really helps us with the pollinator plan and has provided these photographs of really nice displays with just adding a few pollinator friendly uh, varieties. And again, perennials are really, really good for pollinators. So these are traditional bedding plants. It's also worth saying that it's not sustainable to c continue to use annuals like that. Like a, a lot of the time, you know, groups or park managers are putting those in two or three times a year. And it's almost like, dis you know, disposable flowers. So they look good for a while and then they take them out and they put in new ones. And it's costly, you know, that annual bedding, we've done a, a cost analysis and it's like 10 to 29 euros uh, per meter squared. Whereas if you put in perennials, it'll be 10 to 19 euros per meter squared, but they'll live for 10 to 12 years with maintenance. So it is more sustainable. Again, we have to challenge ourselves all the time about sustainability and it also looks really impressive. And there's lots of different types. So again, on the website on pollinator study, all these lists are available of what plants are pollinator friendly and will bring butterflies and bees to your garden. Um, we also have herb lists and uh, fruits and so on. This is a really nice idea as well. Um, a lot of community groups are putting in orchards, so it's a good for the community, good for climate action. So again, in your garden, you might not have space for an orchard, but you might have space for one apple tree uh, or two other apple trees. So nice to get um, Irish heritage variety apple trees from Irish Seed Savers Association. Again, there's lots of uh, resources in, listed in the book where you can get these sort of species. Pesticides cause a big problem for pollinators, not just in terms of killing pollinators, but they also remove their food source. So this sort of spraying isn't sustainable anymore. And, um, you know, does this look better than just grass or grass growing out on, on a path? This is a, a stream where there was kids swimming downstream um, and it spread, you know, all along the water course. Um, around trees as well, you know, is it not possible to use a strimmer in this area or to let the grass grow a bit longer or along, you know, I think the days of using pesticide as a way of tidying up are over. You know, we should only use it, we still have to use it for invasive species, but in terms of using it to tidy, probably, you know, we should leave those days behind. And it's not just, you know, insecticides obviously kill insects, but also herbicides remove their food. 
but they've also shown that insecticides can affect their ability to reproduce. Or Dara Stanley in the UCD is doing amazing work on bumblebees where she puts trackers on the bees and they go out of her lab and they go foraging. And when she's exposed them to small, really small amounts of insecticide, they, they go out and forage, but they come back without pollen. So that's really interesting that it's affecting their ability to uh, reproduce and have further generations. Just to mention as well, if you're involved in tidy towns, the tidy towns groups have been absolutely amazing to work with and have completely embraced the pollinator plan. These are just two of the groups, Clonmel and Gishel, from Crana as well in North or in Donegal, have been amazing doing change in their approach to tidy towns completely. And as I said, super value have been wonderful to work with. So the pollinator plan is basically a, a call to action. So whether you want to help bees or if you want to help Irish growers or farmers, or if you like wildflowers and other flowering plants, or if you like birds and mammals, or if you like eating food, um, we, we're happy to work with every sector. And I'll just leave it on that picture because I think it's brilliant. You know, we, gardens used to be, when we lived in a more wild, natural sort of landscape, a garden was something that you, you know, wanted in the 18th century, you wanted to have it, uh, you know, structured and ornamental and very, very tidy, and it made it look different from everything else. But now things have flipped a little bit, and I think it's much more interesting to have your garden full of life and full of variety, which is, you know, less common um, in our more tidy landscapes. And that's it. Hopefully you're still there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Juanita. That was great. That was really interesting and informative and a really important message. Um, and I suppose part of the message is less is more to some extent. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You can sit back on Sunday morning and stay in bed late and read the paper rather than going out in your lawnmower. Exactly. <laughs> um, just wanted to say we've had a few queries about um, making the presentation available. We are recording it, we think, as I say, this is our first time. So we hope we're recording it and we will be putting it up on our YouTube channel. So we'll send on the link to anybody who's, who's attended tonight. Um, we've had a number of questions, um, some live on air now and some that were sent in um, by email a few days ago. Which would you prefer to take first? Whatever suits you, Anne. I hope I'll be able to answer them. I probably won't. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll maybe take one or two of the ones from the emails and Mark, I can switch between the two. Okay. This one is from Brian. I purchased Irish wildflower seed online but haven't sown it as yet as I'm uncertain if that is the right thing to do. Is it or should I be patient and wait for local wildflowers to seed my garden over several years? Um. If you've already bought it, yeah, you know, you, you want to use it, I suppose. But like I said, we, we would always encourage people to actually reduce mowing first. And one really important point that I didn't make is that what you want to do is reduce the fertility of the soil. So if you have a lawn that's all grass and you've been putting on fertilizer, that'll be a lot more difficult for wildflowers to compete with the grasses. What you want to do is mow, remove the clippings. You don't want to mulch them back in because that'll increase fertility and grasses will always outcompete wildflowers. So you want infertile soil, it's sort of counterintuitive. You want, if you have a bare patch of ground, I definitely wouldn't touch it. Let see what comes up. That's why you tend to see, uh, I, I, you know, if you see a new road uh, structure, all these poppies emerge. It's because the seed bank is there and they tend to get a chance finally uh, when the ground is disturbed to compete with those grasses. So really important to reduce that fertility completely up to you if you want. Another good thing, if you're not sure they're native, rather than spreading them in an open way, you could plant them in a barrel or a, you know, a pot and actually see them as an ornamental uh, wildflower or in a kind of contained bed rather than spread them across a large area. That's what a lot of people do. And there is a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of confusion out there. You know, there's a lot of people branding themselves as Irish native seed and they're not. And there's a lot of seed bombs that are saying they're, you know, a good idea and native seed and um, the pollinator plant even gets its logo put on things that we haven't uh, supported. So do your research, you know, try and find out if it's native and what a great thing to do is to actually go out and collect your own wildflower seed. So, you know, in autumn, 
it's really easy to do. We have guides on pollinators.ie to go out and collect things like knapweed and birds with trefoil and actually take the seed and grow it up yourself and then put it into your garden. So firstly, I would say, yeah, definitely see what's there, first of all. And if you have an area with a lot of grass, you might want to put in yellow rattle. You can buy yellow rattle, which is great. Um, species that will actually parasitize the grass so it gives helps wildflowers to have a chance to grow. Great. The next one is about hedgehogs. It's from Anne in Duradoyle in Limerick and she's interested in hedgehogs having had two in the garden over time but neither of them stayed very long and she's just wondering what more they can do to help them live in the garden. Okay well the fact that they came in that's a sign that they you know it's it's good for hedgehogs. The main hedgehogs actually travel an awful lot so they can travel a few kilometers at night when they're foraging. The main obstacle to them coming into your garden is usually access. So if you do want to make it accessible you need to have a little hole at the bottom of a fence say like if it's all uh, chicken wire or you know fencing around your garden they won't be able to go in and out. Or if you, you know, dogs, they might avoid it. But they often enter gardens for pet food, especially cat food. They love cat food. Really important not to put out bread and milk. That's kind of an old wives' tale. It's really bad for them. Uh, it can make them really sick. So it's cat food and water is if you did want to feed hedgehogs. But they'll also have a great time on your slugs and snails and insects in the garden. But it's really just access. that That's the, the main, you know, obstacle. Or if it's a busy road or so on, you know, that... You can, I, I find it, I didn't say much about hedgehogs in the book because you don't want to give people false hope. I know that, you know, you can go into shops and buy hedgehog houses and things like that, but you might never get a hedgehog visiting. So it really depends if they're using your garden as a, you know, a thoroughfare. So if you want, if you're in a housing estate and there's a lot of gardens together, you could make sure that your neighbor's uh, gardens are also accessible. Great. Um, I think you've kind of answered this one. It's from John. He's saying, I was considering converting our lawn into a more biodiverse mix and wondered if you have any thoughts or sources of help and advice. But I think you've kind of covered that. Yeah, so again, just if you go into the garden section on pollinators.ie, um, you know, there are step-by-step uh, -step how to make a lawn, take a lawn from just grass to a uh, more biodiversity friendly. And it does mean think, think of food, think of clover and dandelions and things like that. Okay, the next one is a hedge. Now I might put up a photograph of this hedge. It was, um, oh, I have to share a screen, don't I? Um, it was from Kate who wondered what she should do with this hedge. Um, here's the hedge. And she said, in my back garden hedge, there's hawthorn all mixed up with ivy and shrubs and privet, I think. I'd like to keep the hawthorn and whatever I do with the hedge. Is it better to just trim it lightly or would it be better to cut it back hard and let it grow up again? I might plant the rest into Hawthorne. So it's currently about 10 feet. Yeah, I can't really tell what some of those are, but it is important to say like if it's elder and ivy, you know, think and bramble, that's really, really good already. Um, it doesn't look like it's, depending on whether the photograph was taken now or, or a while ago, you know, if it's not flowering, it's not necessarily enough hawthorn in it. What I would recommend with something like that, if you do want to cut it down a bit, you could cut it up and you could plant some more hawthorn. It doesn't mean you have to take out anything, actually. Um, you could take out uh, lilandes and things like that, which aren't really great for anything. But you can also do a line, another line within a hedge, if you know what I mean. So putting, uh, whitethorn whips are really, really small. So if you put those in and let it build up, you, you have a kind of a double hedge and that's an amazing uh, space for wildlife. So completely up to you. If you did want to remove some of it, the privet, say, but privet's a, a native species as well, if you have a native one, um, you know, and replace some with whitethorn, but not necessarily, you know, it might be doing a good job as it is. Very good. Thanks, Renita. And I'll hand over to Sinead now. Sinead, do you want to take some of the questions here? Well, just um, just one that stands out to me because Renita did mention Tidy Towns and I would do quite a bit of work with Tidy Towns groups. Uh, this, this is the future of Tidy Towns, absolutely. And you see more and more groups across Limerick um, just embracing this. It's fantastic. 
So it's very important to bring, say, those that might have the older mindset that might be still on the Tidy Towns Committee, that it's about tidy. I, I've gone through so many reports this year and the Tidy Towns adjudicator has given out, across Limerick, given out about the yellow strip from, um, from using sprays right through to complimenting, seriously complimenting people on their perennials um, and their pollinator friendliness and all the rest of it. Very important. This is the way the adjudicators are going. So <coughs> it's hard to change people, but keep, what would you say to try and keep that up, if you like, keep that pressure no, no, on? You're dead right. It's brilliant to see. I, and I think Super Value and the department have really, they've done that themselves. They've, you know, they want to make it more biodiversity friendly. It's kind of unfortunate that it has tidy in the title because it's so much more than that. And I do, I have really been surprised. I've found that the tidy tenants groups are absolutely, they become passionate about it. You know, even, you know, we've had award winners who have told us that one or two members might not have been happy about it and didn't, you know, wanted things neat and didn't like reducing grass cutting. But then slowly when they started to see the change, Yes. And the kids started to be able to go out and do ecology field trips, you know, in their school garden and things like that, that they, it brought something else to it. Actually, on pollinators.ie, um, there's a blog section and there's community blogs and blogs from lots of different um, local community groups, tiny towns groups, explaining, you know, why they took on the pollinator plan and the actions and how they found it and what worked for them. And and obstacles absolutely there are challenges with all of this i would say that like it's not easy to suddenly have long grass that you need to cut so you might need to use the side if you're leaving it for a whole year or a strimmer you know that's difficult so we're not saying there aren't obstacles for councils there can be huge obstacles if they're suddenly changing their mowing regime in parks or along you know roundabouts and so on but by sharing the information and what works for different sectors, I think, you know, it is achievable and it's been amazing to see them, you know, rise, rise to the occasion that Tidy Tens groups really have encouraged each other as well. And through those blogs, you can see it. So I suppose, yeah, you, I do talk, sometimes I've done talks and you talk about the bees and the bees are starving and the cream bumblebees, and then someone will come up at the end and say, but I hate dandelions. So, you know, you're never going to convince everyone, but I suppose it's that idea of maybe you can put up with some of it. So, you know, you, you might still want your daffodils, but can you also plant uh, bulbs that are pollinator friendly among them? You know, there's millions spent in this country on daffodils every year. And could we divert some of that money towards pollinator friendly varieties? But you can still have your daffodils. You know, people associate them with spring. They're affectionate about them. Um, but so you're not saying don't do it. You're just saying, can you also maybe include something that's more uh, wildlife friendly? I think you just add Absolutely. And just on the, the dandelions, and um, one of our colleagues, Anna Mine, his honeybees will bypass apple blossoms for dandelions. It's their, yeah. it's their food of choice over it apple is. blossoms. So. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing, as much as we don't like them, you know, we don't have to go to a garden centre and buy them. You know, it can be your good deeds by leaving them a while, letting them flower. And, and honestly, when you start to see them differently as a food source, they do become, like I've seen people call them little sunshines and, and the sort of thing, that they are bright and yellow and, you know, they become more and more attractive as you know what they're doing. <laughs> There's a question here that maybe Sinead and I will take. So it's from Yvonne who says, we're trying so hard as a tidy towns group, but how can we cope when the local authority is still paying contractors to spray footpaths and housing estates? When people see those in authority using it, it legitimizes it. I know we're all in agreement that the pollinator plan needs implementing, but how can we concerned citizens engage and push the agenda forward? And how can those in the council who, who see the way forward? Um, I suppose the answer to that is we need to reduce pesticide use and herbicide use, and we realise that. And we're currently starting a review of our pesticide use in the council to see why we use it, where we use it, how we use it, and to eliminate it where it isn't strictly necessary. But often it's the people who are against something who are most vocal. So when we make a change, like letting our verges grow as we have done around the city in some areas, or letting grass grow in a park, 
we often get the people who don't like the change being most vocal. And it's really important that the people who support changes are heard as well. So if you like something you see, then let, let people know through Twitter, let your councillors know. If you want to change in your area, get onto your local councillor and let them know because they're not always aware that their local people want to change. So it's really just get your voice heard and we are listening and we are trying to change. A big organisation changes slowly, but it does change and we do recognise the need to change. So that's a really good point and, and we hear that around the country that unfortunately the phone calls made to local authorities are usually um, you know, negative. It might be one or two people saying, my grass hasn't been cut. And once it's explained to them why, that it's an action under the pollinator plan and, you know, they're trying to provide a more biodiversity um, rich areas, then the people actually generally accept that and understand what's going on. But unfortunately, the people that are delighted by it tend to tell us, but they don't ring the local authority. You know, that, that sort of connection is really, really important to, to say. And I think in terms of everything, to, to be kind of vocal about the fact that you care about biodiversity is a great thing generally. You know, when you're voting, when you politicians come to your door, you know, it, it needs a voice. And when councils are doing amazing work, really, the, you know, our council partners and even ones that haven't signed up yet because it's a very new framework, you know, it's been an amazing to work with environmental awareness officers and heritage officers and engineers around the country that actually do want to implement change but it does take time in a process like that. Yeah. Um, Peter wants to know how he can get yellow rattle to establish um, in his he's got a four acre field but he's trying to replicate the garden no mowing during the summer but sheep in the winter and he wants to know how he can get yellow rattle established. Okay, well, there's two really good seed companies um, designed by nature. It's wildflowers.ie, I think it's the website, and Eco Seeds in Northern Ireland. And both of those um, are certified, you know, native Irish seed producers. Um, so if you talk to them about and get your yellow rattle from there, they can give you brilliant advice. I wouldn't be sure what type of soil you have, whether it's, you know, whether you already might have good variety of grasses and so on, especially if you sheep. So it might be good to see what grows and talk to them in terms of, they'll be able to tell you the soil pH and, and different, you know, real specific stuff about what will do best in your soil. And so I suppose then with um, Peter, and this comes planting hedgerows of native Irish species and what species would you recommend for pollinators? And just to link it also with the notion of maybe transplanting something you find out in the wild and bringing it home with you and your thoughts on that as well, okay. if you might have yeah. a question later. No problem. Yeah, well, first of all, say bluebells, for instance, you know, we shouldn't take those. We shouldn't even take wood from a forest, actually, because it's doing a job there. So, you know, if you do want to source wood for a log pile, you need to talk to maybe a forestry manager and see, do they have, um, you know, cut, cut away stuff that they've taken out of the forest. Don't just go in and, and uh, kind of take it from a habitat where it's already doing work. Bluebells, likewise, you know, we can't lose bluebell woodlands to everyone wanting to put them in the garden. And often those species won't do well when you transplant them. So I wouldn't bother. Um, sorry, hedgerows. Again, we have guidelines for hedgerows in our how-to guides in, on the pollinator plan. It's basically 75% white thorn and then 25% of a range of other species like black thorn, um, you know, wild rose. There's, there's lots of different varieties that you can put in there, but it's generally 75% white thorn. And the key is to, you know, the management is really important. So you're putting them in as whips, but you're hoping that they'll grow up and then um, not cut them every, until every two years, two or three years um, to let them bloom. Lovely. Um, I have one here that I kind of thought I answered by accident with the wrong answer. Um, uh, Mose wants to know what would like to be able to quantify habitats, plants, trees in terms of how many, what kind of species they sustain. Would you have that kind of information or know where I can find it? Um, 
sorry, were you? I'm uh, sorry, and so he w wants. That's very specific. I think you'd you'd need. It depends on every area. So, you know, you, you, if an ecologist went to an area and was doing a biodiversity audit, they'd have to look at exactly you know what species you have and how many are associated. You know, you'd have to look at every different aspect: the insects, the wildflowers, the you know lower plants and and shrubs and so on. No, I I wouldn't have stats on exactly how many species but they, they have rough figures for instance willow will support over 100 insects or irish insects so there's some for available for species that people have studied um but i don't or maybe i misunderstood the question but i think it's guidance on um on being able to do a survey himself would there be something okay. like the national biodiversity data center website well, absolutely. I mean, there's loads of guides there that you can take and use yourself and lots of amazing Irish books like Zoe Devlin's Wildflowers books are amazing um, on getting out there as a beginner and learning to identify these things yourself. Absolutely. And there's ecology courses and the data center. Obviously, we haven't run any courses in the last few months, but we, we do offer training that anyone can sign up for to, you know, learn more about uh, insect and plant and mammal identification even so have a look on the website once that's up and running again Great. just also mention birdwatch ireland there because they're a voluntary group now and although they a lot of their meetings wouldn't be had at the moment um they would do a lot of bringing people along from being beginners to being very good bird watchers absolutely in, yeah and also to keep in mind the national biodiversity the data centers um just their uh, reporting system that it isn't just for experts so if Not you know, <laughs> yeah so if you know your one or two butterflies it's good to log it in there or if you know your one or two garden species no matter where you are be it in the city center or out in the county it's good to do that because it's all records and it all helps absolutely Sinead, um maybe I wonder if you could talk about what might be happening with the Community Environmental Enhancement Fund this year in view of COVID-19. Do we know, just because it's one thing that does provide support to, um, to community groups for actions that support Yes, them. and biodiversity would be one of the themes within that. Um, so normally what happens, and this year is a year like no other, so normally what has happened what would happen is we would expect that to be released around august time okay with a view to the grants 50 percent of the grants to successful applicants being paid before christmas um 2020 and then on foot of the completion report you would expect then to get the remaining 50 percent in early 2021 okay Great. So it, it, this year is just a little bit different, but that's what I'm expecting. It is released by the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment. Um, and it, they, are, they are in charge of the timing, if you like. But this is what they're trying to do um, since last year when they introduced the, the fund, the new na newly named fund, if you like. And one of our attendees has just reminded me to mention what's the buzz. Um, oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant interactive course. Um, but Ms. Gabbett uh, designed it and really good way of learning the six most common bumblebees. And it's fun as well. And it's very rewarding. And also the fit counts. I think they are really fun actually to go out for, you know, with a good reason to sit down and watch a quadrat of, you know, 50 centimeters square and just you know, set your timer and look at insects. Like that's free therapy and mindfulness. They're in, in, in all in one and you get to record data for, you know, the national database. Excellent. And just what's the buzz can be downloaded from either the National Biodiversity Data Centre's website or it's hosted on the council's website as well. So if you yeah. can search for what's the buzz, you'll, you'll find the links to it. Um, I think that that's pretty much everything. Just to say, unless there's any Final questions there. I'll just have a quick look and see if anything else. Um, no, I think we've answered most of the questions. Our next um, webinar is going to be on uh, an initiative that Juanita mentioned already. Uh, this one, the Don't Mow Let It Grow. 
So on the 11th of June, we'll be having a webinar with um, Rachel Bain from Causeway Coast and Glensboro Council. And she'll be talking about that really lovely initiative that had some really surprising and beautiful results. Hopefully you'll come along and join us for that. Um, and with that, I'll say- And familiar. in fact, yeah, sorry. We'll just add um, that next week, we're hoping to do the virtual, launch the virtual bat walk on Friday the 5th on the YouTube channel. There will be a promotion about that and um, it's been done in conjunction with the Vincent Wildlife Trust and it's a very exciting project. It's the first of its kind in, in Ireland. So we're looking forward to that next week. And I'll send out the link to the YouTube channel to everybody who's attending tonight so you'll be able to go in next next Friday or Saturday, oh, is it Friday, <laughs> Friday the 5th. It's okay if that didn't work on, it's fine. What's that? You don't have to put it up on YouTube, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad that the kids... Anita, it's gone. <laughs> the kids and the two dogs didn't drive in, so that's good. <laughs> so listen, thanks to everybody who came along and just stayed for the duration. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see you at the next webinar. Good night and thanks, Juanita. Thanks, Sinead. Thanks, Sinead. Thank you. Thank you.